first of all, I want to start by thanking the Committee of Lectures, uh, the Center for Afri American Intercultural Studies, the African Studies Association, and my colleagues in the African Studies Forum for helping to bring about this lecture. I know that uh, most of you have seen this little uh, introduction here. Uh, but I want to crave your indulgence to do a little bit of personal introduction. Okay. Hello? All right. We're in business. Let's do it a little bit. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good. All right, let me do a little bit of personal int uh, introduction. Uh, our speaker that you all know as Olufemi Taiwo or Femi Taiwo, I've never known him as Femi Taiwo. I don't, I've never called him Femi Taiwo. Uh, I'm going to refer to him with the moniker that uh, we've always associated with him. Those of us who grew up with him intellectually, uh, we've known him, I've always known him as Malam. And Malam in Hausa, or Arabic, is teacher. And so from the very beginning, he's always been associated with the life of the mind. I uh, went to undergraduate school with him in Nigeria, and uh, we found ourselves again in graduate school in Canada. And he uh, completed his PhD in 1986 uh, in philosophy from the University of Toronto, and went back home and taught for some years. Now, Malam, <laughs> it's actually, he remains an unapologetic and uncompromising member of the moribund Nigerian left. And <laughs> I use the word uncompromising because, you know, I remember many of his, you know, fellow travelers of those days who used to spit fire against the Nigerian bourgeoisie who used to castigate the Nigerian bourgeoisie, many of them today are cozily and comfortably in bed with the bourgeoisie back home. But Malam remains incorruptible. That's why I respect him a lot. Those of us who knew him were not surprised when his last book came out titled How Colonialism Preempted Modernity in Africa. Now, this book, written in the same genre as the late Walter Rodney's How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, essentially argued that, contrary to the Western intellectual postulation, modernity is not really alien to Africa. That Africa, that modernity is actually indigenous to Africa. And Malan went to great lengths throughout Africa, from Nigeria, Ghana, Ethiopia, everywhere, to explore the indigenous roots of modernity in Africa. And like the late Basil Robinson, Basil Davidson, he argues persuasively that indeed, had Africa been left alone, the story would have been different. And so please, it's my pleasure to welcome my friend, my brother, my schoolmate and everything, Mala, to the stage. Wow, I hadn't looked behind me. I didn't know the room was so full. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome. I always feel very strange when I have people who have known me from way back introduce me. It always feels like an out-of-body experience because knowing how screwed up I am, and they do know that, it always feels strange, you know, so I'm beginning to think, that cannot be me. Um, so thank you very much, uh, uh, Tunde, for that very generous uh, introduction. Yes, we go way back. And I always am thankful uh, that uh, as old friends, through all our divergences and disagreements, we still find it worthy to continue to relate to one another. Uh, I'm not the easiest person to be friends with, all my friends know that. But I'm always thankful 
that we all find a way to enrich one another and ensure that we all grow together without leaving anyone behind. For that, I will always be grateful. <clears throat> and I would like to thank all those who had a hand in putting this program together, uh, from the person who booked my ticket to the, all the emails that I always fail to respond to until today gets frantically on the phone to remind me of my very lousy email etiquette. Uh, uh, so here we are. I am grateful. I'm grateful to the uh, program, the African-American and African Studies uh, program here, of which uh, is uh, director, uh, for bringing me here. And I'm grateful to all of you for thinking that spending this evening uh, with me is uh, worth it. I will do my best to, I hope, make it worth it for you. <clears throat> the title of my talk is Africa's Second Struggle for Freedom. What's modernity got to do with it? Whether you call it independence or freedom, it doesn't matter. Um, I will explain what I mean uh, in a few minutes. <clears throat> I would like to begin by thanking the organizers of this program. And my, I always like to read when I can from prepared text, because if I start ad libbing, you're not going to live here tonight. I love to talk. <clears throat> and my dear friend, classmate, and interlocutor of many years, Professor Tundi Adeleke, whose scholarship has always educated me in more ways than he will ever know. And to all of you, I am very happy to be here. As I said at a different location two weeks ago, I wonder when Africans will stop stinking up the joint. On the eve of that day that I was scheduled to speak there, as I am about to do here, to persuade people that, regardless of their foreign provenance, there is nothing in the African soil, air, or water that makes the continent an inhospitable location for liberal democracy and the rule of law. Some miscreant military adventurists in Mali made a coup d'etat against the popularly elected democratic government of that country. They could not have been more mistaken. Two days ago, their coup was reversed. So I come today in more optimistic circumstances, reinforced by the corroboration of my certitude, a strong word for a philosophy teacher to order, much less use that the era of military adventurism and rascality and of the coups that are usually their preferred vehicles is over in Africa. Thanks to the activities of the economic community of West African states, ECOWAS, their coup has been reversed. I am mad that they were allowed to negotiate an amnesty for making the coup in the first place. And I hope that a future democratic government in Mali reverses that amnesty and puts them on trial and puts them in the camp, however long that may take. Why is this important? <clears throat> Both ECOWAS and the African Union, AU, dropped the ball two years ago when the then president of Cote d'Ivoire staged a constitutional coup by refusing to give up office, having lost elections, the results of which he had undertaken in writing to respect. He took French forces and the insurgent forces that had been fighting him to unseat him while the AU dithered and, it turned out, restrained ECOWAS from sending military help to unseat him. The two organizations this time around were eager to show the world that Africa was not merely ready to move forward. More importantly, the continent would no longer claim any more exception to the general run of historical development to be found in the rest of humanity. <clears throat> Unfortunately, this is not the way that the issue is presented in these parts. In fact, the day the coup happened in Mali, an African studies expert from the University of London, I think it was, was on BBC World Service News pontificating on how popular the Mali coup was, how fed up people were with the government of Amadou Toumani Touré, ATT as they popularly call him there, and how there were serious allegations of corruption tied to drug trafficking by elements of the Malian administration, and so on and so forth. For that so-called expert, Africa was just being, quote unquote, Africa. 
and there's no need for the rest of humanity to be overly concerned. After all, that is Africa. It is unlike any place else. This is what I call in my work the metaphysics of difference, and you will be hearing more about it in what follows. For now, let me share with you three other vignettes. <clears throat> the first one. Presidential elections were held in Ghana in December 2008. The two leading candidates in the first round had a runoff that was won by the man who is still the president of Ghana, John Atamios. That by itself is no cause for comment. But he won by a slight fraction of 1% of all votes cast. The losing candidate at first sounded as if he was going to ask for a recount or even go to court to contest the election, the outcome. Ultimately, he chose to accept the results. That is, no recount, no challenge, no acrimony. According to him, he and his party have four years to undo the results. And as I speak, he is gearing up for this year's version against the same incumbent. Contrast that outcome and the losing candidate's equanimity in accepting the results with the solid record of Florida in 2000 or this year's Republican primaries in a handful of states, including, if I'm not mistaken, this one. <clears throat> How much coverage did Ghana's successful elections attract in the American press? I'm sure those of you who are paying attention can recall very little. <clears throat> Number two. Presidential and parliamentary elections were held in Kenya in December 2007. And in the aftermath, there was mayhem. Some of the leaders who have been identified as sponsoring the mayhem have recently had indictments returned against them by the International Criminal Court at The Hague. And of course, the news was all over the place. Here. Three, Zambia held presidential and parliamentary elections in December 2011. The incumbent president lost and the ruling party he headed lost the control of parliament. The incumbent president promptly relinquished power and said, and I quote, we just did not reach the voters this time around, end of quote. Another point about the Zambian election, the vice president on the winning ticket is a white Zambian. This is not to say, the last time I checked, no one has, no doubts have been raised about his Zambian citizenship. This is not, you know something I don't know? But, uh, <clears throat> this is not to say that Zambia has not had its share of the latest refuge for scoundrels, Bertholism. A former president of the country, uh, Frederick Chiluba, did question the citizenship of the founding president of Zambia, Kenneth Kaunda, a long time ago. This only goes to show that hatred is an equal opportunity employer. Why are these vignettes important for the task at hand this evening? They do not feature enough, if at all, in the narrative about Africa that is prevalent in the United States and definitely in African studies. The dominant orientation is that Africa and liberal democracy don't mix. The founding myth of this orientation is traceable to the metaphysics of difference inaugurated by the social Darwinists and their fellow travelers in colonial anthropology in the late 19th century in Europe <clears throat> against the metaphysics of difference. <clears throat> the study of Africa and what we specifically call African studies in this country and I think in Canada are dominated by what I call the metaphysics of difference. Africa is always locked in a box marked different. The fact that Africans, for the most part, have also come to embrace this orientation does not make it any less odious. Indeed, their embrace of it makes it more so. The idea is that Africa and things African are radically different from things elsewhere and other peoples and cultures that they must always be understood differently, apprehended differently, and, if they turn out to be problems, must have different solutions sought for them. Such is the hold of the metaphysics of difference 
that in most, if not all, disciplines, we hardly feel, much less suggest, that African phenomena are nothing more than the idiomatic apprehensions of universal themes. The end result is that we often assume, mistakenly and convinced, that the solutions that have availed for the rest of the world will not translate well in Africa. It is almost as if African phenomena are irremediably sui generis. Simultaneously, we routinely dismiss the possibility of applying to similar problems elsewhere in the world <clears throat> solutions that have been authored by Africans. In light of the putative radical difference of Africans from the rest of the human race, we seem to think that there can be no African insights into the universal that can be of use to other humans. <clears throat> My focus in this lecture turns on the play of the metaphysics of difference in our understanding of liberal democracy in Africa. As a result of it, we are yet to permit ourselves to take seriously the contributions of African thinkers to the political philosophical discourse of modernity. A cult of difference dominates African studies in the United States. African themes are always treated differently either because of a desire to exclude fellow native scholars from sharing expertise on Africa, or because of an overpowering inclination to appear original, a sui generis African studies converges with a sui generis quote-unquote Africa, for which new concepts, new explanatory paradigms, and vocabulary must always be invented. The consequence is that whatever new insights the study of Africa might have contributed to the disciplines broadly defined are obscured by the Africanist celebration of what I call the occult of difference and the consequent frightening off of uninitiated scholars from efforts at learning from Africa. To give you just one very simple example, the problem that we call federalism, the problem of federalism in Canada, in Nigeria, is given a different name in African studies. It's called tribalism. And I've never had anybody talk about tribalism in Canada or in Belgium. But when you look at the three countries and what they're struggling with, they have the same problem. So what that means is that if you're a, federal, a scholar of federalism in Canada or the United States, you are not likely to think that there are African thinkers who have written some very insightful books on federalism. And there are. I'll be talking about one of them later in this lecture. <clears throat> the result is that Africa is not thought with the rest of the world. Yes, the election in Ghana should not have called for comment, but in light of the accepted wisdom regarding Africa's relation to liberal democracy, we should remark it. Contrast the benign neglect in the US press of the Ghana situation and that of Zambia with the overwhelming attention paid to Kenya in the aftermath of its elections in 2008. I guess, as the saying goes, if it bleeds, it leads. I protest because it seems as if, if the press in this country is to be believed, it never stops bleeding in Africa. <clears throat> I argue that while we isolate, analyze, and sometimes celebrate historical differences among different regions, cultures, peoples, and traditions of the world, humanity is essentially one. I am convinced beyond all doubt that other than death and much more than taxes, you know as they say that the only two things that are certain are death and taxes. I think the, the death part is true, but taxes I don't think so. Uh, because think of Italy, think of Greece, and think of Nigeria. Taxes don't occur in those places. So there's a sense in which we can say that, you know, uh, taxes are not certain in those places. But I have come up with something that is certain. <clears throat> the only thing that is certain in the world other than death is the following fact. Humans mess up. <laughs> if you see two people just turning to each other in a language you don't understand, chances are one is telling the other, you have messed up again. <laughs> In thinking Africa with the rest of the world, we are allowed to see in clearer and bolder relief the similarities and differences among the world's inhabitants beyond the essentializing of Africans and turning us into a species radically different from the rest of common humanity. 
In other words, Africans are no different from other peoples. As humans, we mess up. I, I did this in the final chapter of my book that Tunde has just generously introduced to you, where I showed that contrary to received wisdom, Africans have not been only victims of globalization. In a very real sense, we have also been globalizing like the rest of the world. For the Africans in the audience, when was the last time you had to bring your own food store by yourself in order for you to eat local in your global location? They are available everywhere now, so you no longer have to truck them in your own boxes. <clears throat> by thinking Ghana and the United States together regarding the outcomes of particular elections, we realize that messing with elections is not the exclusive preserve of, quote unquote, underdeveloped Africans. Ghana didn't mess with elections, Florida did. But the US continues to accredit election observers, but they will not allow Africans to observe US elections as election observers. Because the assumption is, what is there to observe? Elections are always transparent here. We know better. <clears throat> In case you still doubt this claim, I refer you to all the mad attempts being made by Republican Party controlled state assemblies across the country and their determined efforts to suppress the vote in the elections coming up later this year and the diktat under which many cities in Michigan are now run thanks to the state governor's decree since it took over in 2010. <clears throat> On modernity. The anchor for my thinking Africa with the rest of the world has been the political philosophical discourse of modernity. Modernity is crucial because it is one half of the justification of colonialism. And when Africans fought the struggle for independence, that's the first struggle, it was in the name of the self-same modernity and its core tenets that they did so. <clears throat> Various components make up the modern way of life. The first is what I call a philosophical anthropology that is traceable to G.W.F. Hegel, yes, the same one who libelled Africa in the philosophy of history. <clears throat> and he calls it the principle of subjectivity. The right of the subject's particularity is right to be satisfied, or in other words, the right of subjective freedom is the pivot and center of the difference between antiquity and modern times. This right in its infinity is given expression in Christianity and it has become the universal effective principle of a new form of civilization. Among the primary shapes which this right assumes are love, romanticism, the quest for the eternal salvation of the individual. Next come moral convictions and conscience, and finally, the other forms, some of which come into prominence in what follows as the principle of civil society and as moments in the constitution of the state while others appear in the course of history, particularly the history of art, science, and philosophy. <clears throat> so far, Hegel. The sociological concomitant of this metaphysical principle is what we call individualism. No doubt, the idea of individualism predated the modern age. But my contention is that, one, the notion of the individual that is dominant in the modern age is without precedent, at least in the Euro-American tradition from which the remaining parts of the world who have embraced modernity extracted it. And two, it is under the modern regime that individualism is the preferred principle of social ordering, and almost everything else is understood in terms of how well or ill it serves the interest of the individual. Thus, although it is true that there was some recognition of the individual in pre-modern epochs, it is in the modern epoch that the individual is not merely supreme. Whatever detracts from the rights of the individual is precisely for that reason to be rejected. <clears throat> this notion of the individual took a long time to emerge, but it received one of its most dramatic consecrations in the Protestant Reformation when the subject, that is the individual, was made the centerpiece of Christian soteriology. The subject must win eternity for himself, helped of course by grace. One's genealogy, status, and similar attributes counted for nothing, or at least theoretically, ought to count for nothing in the allocation of goods, services, or even recognition. 
The key element is that of individual striving. What the individual makes of herself and whatever talent she is endowed with by nature. To so this principle, we trace what we call the merit principle. The meritocracy that promises rewards to individuals according as they show themselves worthy by developing their talents. One consequence of the focus on the individual in the modern state is that no longer are individuals' futures determined by the circumstances of their birth. Humans can abridge status, class, and other boundaries as long as they are willing to improve themselves enough to fit them for whatever station they aspire to occupy. One can easily see how racism and sexism, wherever they exist, subvert this modern orientation. The second component that I would like to talk about is a social ontology respecting the relation between the individual and the community manifested in the peculiar bifurcation between state and civil society. It is the basis for probably the most dramatic innovation brought about by modernity in its wake, the principle of governance by consent. I refer to the central tenet of political theory in the modern age, under which no one ought to acknowledge the authority of, or owe an obligation to obey, any government in the constitution of which he or she has played no part. That is, no government is legitimate to which the governed have not consented. When the American revolutionaries first used this principle as their rallying cry in 1776, it was the first culmination of a new principle of legitimacy, the philosophical grounds of which had been foreshadowed in the writings of Thomas Hobbes, John Locke, and Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and others. From that point on, whether it was in the French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, people don't usually think of it as part of the process, but it is. The much less abrupt transfer of power from the monarch and the nobility to the House of Commons in Britain, the authority of every ruler by the grace of God or by reason of birth was vulnerable to the challenge posed by the new thinking concerning the issue of who ought to rule when not all can rule. Uh, there are two others here that I mentioned, but I will not spend time on them. First is what I call the idea of progress, and it's a horizon of time where the future is always to be, never is, it's always becoming. And the last is what I call the centrality <coughs> of reason, uh, <coughs> which was the basis for the scientific uh, revolution. A derivative in political philosophy of the principle of subjectivity is that no one should be subject to the authority of a government in the constitution of which he has had no hand. It is what we call the principle of governance by consent. At the heart of the African challenge to the authority of colonial rule in the struggle for independence was this principle. I will now proceed to give you evidence of this commitment by African thinkers in what I call Africa's first struggle for independence. <clears throat> Africans have never been celebrated for being singers of freedom's song. Yet, all it takes to correct this misleading impression is to look at the records ever since slavery and the transatlantic slave trade, and what you will find is that in the context of modernity, Africans have appropriated the tenets identified above and fought their oppressors in the name of those tenets. In chapter six of how colonialism preempted modernity in Africa, I reported two experiments at authoring and instituting a government based on the consent of the governed in two areas of Ghana and Nigeria, respectively, in the 19th century. Uh, one was what was called the Fanti Confederacy, and the other in Nigeria, that was in Ghana. The other in Nigeria was called <coughs> the Egba United Board of Management. Uh, the one in Ghana was remarkable because they actually wrote a constitution, and they formally adopted it. And then they sent word to the British governor this is what we have done, and this is how we would love to be governed. And the British governor promptly clamped all of them in jail for daring to want to have a liberal democratic government that would be answerable to them. In fairness, I must give you the full story. Uh, after that governor was removed, the new governor released them and actually did apologize to them, but never allowed them to have self-government you know, until independence. The tragedy of Africa is that until I wrote about it in my book, only historians 
have ever written about these two phenomena. No political theorist or philosopher had ever considered it worthy to study these remarkable constitutional experiments in the 19th century in Africa. <clears throat> At the turn of the 20th century, the principle of governance by consent founded on the metaphysical template of the self derived from the specifically modern principle of subjectivity was used as a critical tool to shame British colonial administrators into seeing the evil of its denial of African freedom. So here I give you the evidence. Here is Joseph E. Kesley Hayford on the question of who ought to rule where not all can rule. First, he provided a basis for his agitation for self-rule in the idea of freedom, and I quote, we are living in a new age. Kesley Hayford was from Ghana, and he was the founder of the National Congress of British West Africa. <clears throat> We are living in a new age and a new order of which we who participate in them are hardly aware. One important element of this new order is the growing consciousness of our race the world over of which practical statesmanship must take cognizance. Among world problems today is the appeal which goes from the heart of the African to be accorded certain rights which are common to humanity. We claim that we have the right to our opinion and to the express of it we say that we have passed the childhood stage and that much as we appreciate the concern of our guardians, the time has come for us to take an intelligent, active part in the guiding of our own national destiny. And that is the primary fact that has called into being the National Congress of British West Africa." End of quote. Then it proceeds to contend that no government ought to be instituted unless it is based on the consent of the governed. And I quote, and please listen carefully to this. We claim, in common with the rest of mankind, that taxation without representation is a bad thing. And we are pledged, as all free peoples are about to do, that in our several communities, the African shall have that common weapon for the protection and safeguarding of his rights and interests, namely, the franchise. It is desirable, we hold, that by our vote, we shall determine by what laws we shall be governed and how the revenues which we have to put together shall be utilized. Equally do we hold with others that there should be free scope for the members of the community, irrespective of creed or color, to hold any office under the crown or flag to which a person's merits entitle him or her. <clears throat> Let us fast forward to the latter part of the 20th century and what we find is what I claim has not received the attention it deserves from African and other scholars of the global African world. That Africans never give up on freedom is attested by the prevalence of that word in the discourse of Africa's independence struggle and its aftermath. And here is a short capsule of that. Obafemi Olowo wrote Path to Nigerian Freedom, and I'm going to be talking about him in a few minutes. Kwame Nkrumah wrote, Towards Colonial Freedom and I Speak of Freedom. Oginga Odinga lamented the unfulfillment of the promise of freedom after independence was won in not yet Uhuru, and Uhuru, I think, is Swahili for freedom. <clears throat> Julius Nyerere wrote, Freedom and Development. Nelson Mandela knew that there was no easy walk to freedom. That was actually the very first uh, autobiography, you know, of Nelson Mandela about the time he went to jail. <clears throat> and Kenneth Kaunda of Zambia wrote, Zambia must be free. These and others are some of the basic texts of modern African political philosophy. One only wish that our professional philosophical output would reflect this simple fact. Nor are these preoccupations with freedom limited to political leaders or thinkers. They also featured, importantly, in popular arts especially high life music by stars ranging from Ghana's E.T. Mensa to Nigeria's Victor Laya and Adeolu Akinsanya, just to mention a handful. I would now like to focus on two African philosophers who insisted that the struggle for independence was a lot more than a struggle for new flags, national anthems, and bureaucracies dominated by African exploiters. It is usual now to commemorate Nkrumah on one hand as a philosopher of African communalism, and on the other of Marxism-Leninism on the African continent. 
This is an incomplete picture of the complexity of Nkrumah's ideas and his legacy. By taking account of the totality of his views, we will be forced away from the layer of hagiography and the temptation of celebrating him as one in whom there is no fault to consider the man, what's and all, and seek ways of advancing the best of his ideas with all their inherent tensions and inconsistencies. At the very beginning of his book, Africa Must Unite, we have the following. Freedom, Sawaba, Uhuru. Sawaba is the Hausa word for freedom. <clears throat> All linguistic variations on the simple idea of freedom. He continued, quote, in this 20th century, there have already been two world wars fought on the slogans of the preservation of democracy, on the right of peoples to determine the form of government under which they want to live. Statesmen have broadcast the need to respect fundamental freedoms, the right of men to live free from the shadow of fears which cram their dignity when they exist in servitude, in poverty, in degradation, and in contempt. <clears throat> in our struggle for freedom, and please note, parliamentary democracy was as vital an aim as independence. The two were inseparable. It was not our purpose to rid our country of the colonial regime in order to substitute an African tyranny. We wanted to free our people from arbitrary rule and to give them the freedom to choose the kind of government they felt would best serve their interests and enhance their welfare." End of quote. That's Nkuna. Now, as I always remind people, the fact that he did not use his own advice does not mean that we should ignore the advice. <clears throat> So far, Nkrumah, we now supply evidence from Obafemi Awolowo <clears throat> from Nigeria. Writing in his autobiography, Awolowo affirmed this unhesitating and unequivocal preference for Western democracy in the context of the then existing division of the world into ideological camps. His unyielding until his death, undiminished commitment to liberal democracy, was an integral part of his embrace of the much wider movement of modernity. <clears throat> And this is what he said. As we planned for Nigeria's independence, we were fully conscious that freedom from British rule does not necessarily connote freedom for individual Nigerian citizens. I and most of my colleagues are Democrats by nature and socialists by conviction. We believe in the democratic way of life, this equality under the law, respect for the fundamental rights of individual citizens, and the existence of independent and impartial tribunals where these rights could be enforced. We believe that the generality of the people should enjoy this life and do so in reasonable abundance. The most detestable feature of British administration was that the governed had no say in the appointment of those who governed them. A Nigerian administration by Nigerians must be erected on the general consent and the united goodwill of the majority of the people. In my view, there can be no satisfactory alternative to this. At the same time, I fully recognize that the healthy growth of a democratic way of life requires the existence of an enlightened community led by a group of people who are imbued with the all-consuming urge to defend, uphold, and protect the human dignity and the legal equality of their fellow men." End of quote. Those in the know can detect echoes of John Stuart Mill and Thomas Jefferson regarding the improvability of human nature and the central role of public education in improving the capacity of ordinary citizens to use the vote judiciously. <clears throat> I hope that the reader begins to see that in our world we are not dealing with an ordinary politician. His commitment to liberal democracy was founded upon his study of modern political philosophy, and it takes but little familiarity with the classics of that genre to realize that the principles enunciated by Awolowo are the same ones that animate the countries, e.g. the United States, that we look up to as models of the democratic way of life. At the bottom of those is the core principle that no one ought to be bound by the dictates of a government in the constitution of which he has had no hand. <clears throat> Given his firm commitment to this principle, he was opposed to one party rule, and he did not think that a government could be legitimate that was not a product of the popular will freely expressed through the mechanisms of fair elections. 
Um, let me skip, you know, because I then explained some of the other elements of liberal democracy that, you know, uh, he wanted to have. <clears throat> Both Nkrumah and Awolowo were insistent that the new regimes put in place after independence should not replicate the ills that characterize the colonial regime, especially its penchant for arbitrary rule, rule that is not consented to by those whom it binds. The centerpiece of this commitment to democracy is the idea of freedom. I am suggesting that political philosophy in contemporary Africa needs to retool and revamp its inventory of concepts to take account of this rich repository that our thinkers have bequeathed to us. Uh, I have other examples from Sudan, you know, of other thinkers who have taken, you know, uh, those positions, uh, both in law, especially uh, the work of uh, uh, Ahmed An Naim, uh, who is a jurist, and he has spent his entire life trying to show that there must be a reformation in Islam so that Islam can come to be in face with modernity. And his argument has been that for that to happen, you cannot have Sharia as the basis of the legal system <clears throat> uh, in a Muslim country. So again, those debates are going on, and they are not being reflected in much of what people read you know, uh, in these parts. <clears throat> so let me now go to the uh, last section, which is the concluding. In lieu of a conclusion, application to current events. In case anyone still has doubts about the relevance of reinscribing African contributions to the political discourse of modernity, I offer as an exemplar what illumination will be brought our understanding of ongoing events in the African continent regarding some of the themes that I have isolated above. One insightful way to make sense of what is going on in Africa, especially its northern parts at the present time, is to look at it as what I call Africa's second struggle for freedom. The events of the last year and a half in Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya are taking place in Africa, not in the Middle East. One would think that this is obvious, but the reporting in the Western inflected global press might make one think otherwise. The dominant narrative in the Western press and academia of separating North Africa from the rest of Africa and locating it in a bastard geographical zone called Middle East is meant to show some crucial divergences in the historical experiences of the peoples that populate the different regions of the continent. More ominously, some might get the mistaken impression that the rallying cry of the movements in the three countries on the boil now, freedom, is something that is not part of the discourse in the rest of Africa. I hope you now see that it's always been, you know, going back to the 19th century. But once we look at the history of the continent and the unifying themes extractable from that history, things begin to look different. To begin with, North African countries, no less than those of the rest of Africa, were not spared the indignities of being colonized, first by the Turks, and later the Spanish, the Italians, the French, and the British. It is significant that, as at this writing, the only unresolved colonial issues in Africa are in the North. Morocco, in Western Sahara, you know, regarding Morocco itself, and in Ceuta, you know, regarding Morocco's relations with Spain. <clears throat> As a result of this shared experience, all parts of Africa fought the first struggle for independence from colonialism and its depredations. People often lose sight of this because of the artificial separation of the continent, both in the literature and in the global, including African, imagination. Yes, the North Africans secured independence earlier than their peers in the rest of the continent. But that does not mean that the aims that informed their respective struggles for independence were not the same. What is more, they were all united in the goal of their struggle. They wanted freedom. Africans wanted the freedom to order their own affairs as they see fit. They did not want to be ruled by any government that they had no hand in installing. They wanted their human dignity restored from the battering it had taken under colonial rule. They wanted governments that were responsible and responsive to them. Above all, they wanted to be free. In their efforts towards a continental union, which culminated in the May 25, 1963 inauguration of the OAU in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, the original signatories to the charter included the leaders of the North African countries. Central to their coming together was to harness 
their collective strength to preserve the freedom they had just won from colonialism. As we saw above, Kwame Nkrumah, one of those signatories, made the overthrow of arbitrary rule and the implantation of parliamentary democracy specific goals of the independence struggle. Unfortunately, once independence was obtained, Africa's rulers, including Nkrumah, decided that the struggle for freedom was over and done with. They proceeded to put in place all manner of political contraptions, all designed to subvert and deny the freedom of their people, turned their citizens to subjects, substituted their wills for those of their people when it came to the installation of governments all across the continent. Any more trucking with freedom? No. They had their coat of arms, their flags, their national anthems, and so on. It was almost as if they thought that the struggle they had led for independence did not include, principally, the freedom of individual citizens to have, hold, and seek to realize their own conceptions of the good life, the proverbial freedom to be led alone, especially by their governors, the impermissibility of governmental interference with the details of their daily lives, limits on the powers of government, and the sanctity of their dignity and their life. In other words, the promise of independence was never redeemed for ordinary Africans at the micro level of their quotidian lives. Watching the images in diverse media from Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, Malawi, Uganda, and in the mid-2000s, Ethiopia and Zimbabwe, to limit myself to Africa, the interviews with young and old, men and women, from all walks of life at the barricades, it is clear that much more than the chronic, economic, and other problems that they have to deal with daily, paramount in their demands is the absolute insistence that they must be free. When Mohamed Bouazizi committed the brave act of self-immolation that triggered the Tunisian revolution, he wasn't dying for country, ethnic group, or religion. He could no longer take the repeated assault on his freedom and dignity as well as that of his countrymen and women. Therein lies the ultimate lesson of the current movements for change in both Africa and the Arab world. The challenge for the rest of us is to ensure that this second struggle for freedom in Africa, and it is only a matter of time before other places erupt too, and we saw the eruption lately in Senegal that swept away the president who was trying to smuggle himself for a third term against the Constitution. <clears throat> it's not allowed to fail. The refusal to abide the coup in Mali falls under this category. We need to stop the stupid race-tinged nationalism that makes some of us abide the excesses of a Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe, a Yoweri Museveni in Uganda, a Meles Zenawi in Ethiopia, and Isaias Afawaki in Eritrea, a Jose Eduardo dos Santos in Angola, and worst of all, the sex-addicted absolute ruler of Swaziland. The freedom of ordinary Africans and their ability at the individual level to control their lives, these lives marked by inviolate dignity for their persons and concurrent limits on the reach of governments in their daily lives must never be up for negotiation. Indeed, this ought to be the standard with which we judge the legitimacy and attractiveness of any government in the continent as it increasingly is the case in other parts of the world that are also embracing modernity. So what's modernity got to do with it? The basic principles of which Africans are emulating themselves, standing up to dictatorial or authoritarian regimes, and generally insisting that they too must be free, are easily traceable to the tenets of modernity that we identified above. By their current actions across the continent, Africans are reminding us for the umpteenth time, freedom is not a geographical, cultural, or national thing. It is a human attribute. Are we listening? Thank you very much for your patience. <clears throat> questions and comments. So please, feel free uh, for your questions or comments. And there is a microphone there. Please. Yes, please. Go ahead. Uh, when I was listening to the talk, yes. and we tried to draw a coherence between what's happening in North America 
Northern Africa, and Africa as a whole, <coughs> something came to my mind that uh, it's possible that this is simplistic in the sense that I don't think in the North African context, I see it in the context of Occidentalism and Orientalism, uh, because the conception of freedom in North Africa might not be the way you actually present it. And this is why it's still an enforced phenomenon. Because for a long period of time, after the fall of Islamic civilization, they started fighting for the conception of their own freedom. So I want to see how your own definition of the civil struggle for Africa in the context of this really fits into the conception of freedom and modernity. I'm not sure I got your question. The conception of freedom in North Africa, in my own view, is different from the conception of freedom in modernity. What's the conception of freedom in North Africa? In North Africa, it has to do with the own belief system. I'm sorry? It, I think it has to do with the own belief system. And that is why when we try to see in Egypt, the modern, the modern trend in Egypt, in Tunisia, is taking scholars in the West by surprise. Because the people tend to be voting for people like the Muslim Brotherhood. Then those people who are banned initially also are being voted for in Tunisia. So you come to realize that there is an imagined context that is different from freedom and modernity. So I want to know how this should be with your own conception of second freedom, second struggle for independence in Africa. Uh, thank you very much. I beg to disagree with you. Um, and I'm glad that you mentioned Tunisia. The Islamic party that is in power in Tunisia last week rejected the call by the junior partner in the coalition for Sharia to be enshrined in the new constitution that they are writing. And that's very significant. And part of the reason why they don't want Sharia put you know, in that constitution is because as somebody like uh, uh, Al Naim you know, argues, if you put Sharia in the Constitution, you cannot take very seriously human rights. And I know that people are always trying to argue that, um, and it's not just about Islam, it's also about you know, various cultures in Africa. I argue this all the time with many African feminists. If you take very seriously the human rights of young girls, you have to go against cultural practices that marry them off at a young age. There's no middle course between it. It's either you go for the preservation of the culture and sacrifice those little girls, or you insist that these little girls must not have their lives subverted even before they started it. And that is precisely what human rights do. And it's very interesting that, you know, yes, there are people in the Muslim world who argue what you are arguing, but there are also many people, and that's why I mentioned An Naim. My favorite example always is the former Prime Minister of Malaysia, Mahathir Mohamed. And he spent the latter part of the early 2000s after he left office, giving lectures all over the place, warning Muslim countries that they better come to terms with modernity because otherwise the future is going to be very tough for them. Um, so I don't want to say that I'm telling you what the quote unquote sole position is. I am saying that there are debates in the Islamic world about all these issues. And that when you take some of the debates that are going on, even in a place like Iran, it's remarkable how many intellectuals, and this is not new, this is not new. Um, the whole business of the relationship between Islam and modernity you know, goes all the way back, at least from my own research, uh, because I've been you know, doing some of this for some time now. At least to the late 18th century you know, and early 19th. So whether you want to talk about the work of somebody like you know, Mohamed Iqbal, you know, uh, or you want to talk about Jaman al Adin al-Afghani, you know, there's so many, you know, so everybody is really, and what I'm trying to say is that when you come into this country, it is precisely that simplistic idea that all Muslims sleep and turn their heads in one direction. That's what I'm challenging. 
So I don't give you what I've just said as the gospel truth. I don't possess one. But I'm saying that this interpretation has very strong legs to stand on in the context of debates going on in the Muslim world. I hope I did justice to your question. And thank you also for reminding us about the emergence of uh, new African leaders and their commitment to democracy. What I find is that there is a missing gap. Okay. Can you explain what happened from the 1960s to the emergence of this new uh, leadership um, that, that, that are promoting democracy? What happened there? Okay. Does it have anything to do with the Cold War? What was happening in the world? Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Good question. Um, you know, at the risk of being simplistic, here is my take on what happened. A whole lot of it has to do with what I call the metaphysics of difference. Because once you believe that Africa is so different and that whatever goes on there is something that we cannot even let the rest of the world look into, and our leaders exploited that to the hilt, so that any time people in the continent raise questions about democracy, either they were called communists or they were called people who just wanted to westernize the continent. Meanwhile, these same people who are putting people in jail for daring to ask for democracy were busy sleeping either with Russia or with London. But internally, there was no room for debate, okay? Meanwhile, the external world, because it was so close to the winning of independence, was very, very reluctant to say anything for fear of being accused of being imperialist, for fear of being accused of being racist. And I must say that the history of global white supremacy did not help the situation in Africa. <laughs> Because the whole idea that, well, you know, it's Africans, that's what they do, actually meant that people were getting free passes for literally tyrannizing, you know, their own people. And what then happened soon after that? Military rule. And whatever the civilians did not destroy, military rule destroyed big time all across the continent. But then what did we find from our scholars in African studies outside they said military were modernizers. And then they started talking about how, oh, these military are building roads, you know, and all that. And the whole idea was, and this for me is the ultimate racism. Africans don't need freedom. They just need full bellies, which practically turns Africans into pets. As long as they have their food, who cares about freedom? But when you go to the continent, those of us who grew up in the first years of independence and all that, we know we were born of parents who always reminded us that you are sometimes better off going to bed hungry than eating the bread of humiliation. They taught us dignity, you know, about not just having something in your belly, but being able to raise your head up high. That lesson was lost, you know, on many of us as time went on. And this was enacted principally by Africa's intellectuals. And as we were saying at dinner earlier this evening, that has not changed. That's the missing link. And my, the, the, the modest aim of all this work is one, to restore these ideas, to let people realize, because people love to talk about how Africans are just discovering democracy. Hell no. They've been writing about this from the 19th century. Actually, I'm going back now to you know, late you know, 18th century, and you then have to connect, you know, uh, what was happening in West Africa, you know, to what was going on in the New World. Because many of those people who went with those arguments, Blyden being one of the famous examples, you know, went from here. And then you have to start reading what was going on in North Africa, you know, and Tunisia again is a very good example, because, you know, Tunisia had always been part 
a very important part of the history of the Mediterranean, <laughs> you know, uh, all the way to Sicily, you know, uh, to Padua, to Spain, you know, and the Mediterranean coast of France, Tunisia had been a part, you know, very important part of that history. And that history was not just history of trade and all that, it was also a history of ideas. Uh, African scholars need to retrieve and recover all this. So we stopped telling these simplistic stories, you know, about this Africa that was all good before white people came, and then they just destroyed everything. So. Can I go with that microphone? Just a question about um, Africa as a continent. Do you think there's room for a super nation, like, almost like the European Union or the federal government of the United States over the state? Do you think something like an African Union with single currency, or is the, is the continent just too big and too diverse to handle something like that? Thank you very much for giving me that good question. Yes, African scholars love to lie about how complex Africa is. And I always love to say to them, you don't know complex. Where is complex? It's called India. <laughs> it's a whole continent that is a country. And talk of all the problems in Africa, multiply it by a significant factor in India. They've had it. So why has India managed to thrive, and all the flag rich, resource poor, you know, respect poor African countries continue to totter along. Okay, that's the first part. The second part is another thing that I find remarkable in terms of how Africa is presented by those of us who study Africa here. Uh, my students last year went, one student went on a conference on population and all that to DC. So he came back and I said, oh, and I'm sure you are all talking about Africa's overpopulation. He said, oh, it's as if you were there. So I said, I got news for you, Bradley. Africa is underpopulated. And the kids jaw dropped. He said, you're not kidding me? I said, no. I said, there are more people in India as we speak than there are in the entire continent of Africa. So, now you see how you come up with useless solutions once you misdescribe the problem. <laughs> In fact, on the contrary, Africa's problem is precisely that it does not have enough people producing enough things. So what you have to worry about is the balance, the distribution of the population in the short term. Because when you take very seriously the business of production, having a young population is an advantage. Having an aged population is a disadvantage. So how do you turn all that youth energy that Africa possesses in abundance into productive you know, activities? Now, it has been the dream of Pan-Africanism from its origins in the 19th century that there should be a union government all across the continent. Unfortunately, you still have their in fairness, the AU is working towards that now. The problem for me is that they're doing it at the top level. It's not going on you know, at the grassroots level. And for it to go on at the grassroots level, you have to take very seriously some of the principles that I'm talking about. Because you must get ordinary people to buy into the idea of a citizenship you know, that goes beyond you know, their immediate locality. Uh, so that's part of the agenda. Uh, but I think one other thing stands in the way, um, and this is related to the question of federalism that I talked about. So in Africa, everybody talks, and African scholars do, about nation building. That's a colonial invention. And the assumption is that there were no nations in Africa until after 1885. And again, African scholars go into all kinds of, you know, call the sacks because as you rightly pointed out, the whole idea is to have a supranational identity. I think in modern political philosophy we call it citizenship. So when Africans take that very seriously, the movement towards a pan-African citizenship will accelerate. But yes, uh, it's been the goal of pan-Africanism from the 19th century.
and continues to be. And lots of writings, original writings, on how to bring this about. And Nkrumah, before he became a dictator, kept talking about you know, how this has to occur on the vehicle of parliamentary democracy. So in another paper a few years ago, I was knocking African Union when they were all following Gaddafi, you know, who wanted to bring Africa together under kings and monarchs. Um, personally, I cannot sign on to that. Maybe I'm too modern for my own good. Uh, any hierarchy that is not based on merit is not a hierarchy that I'm going to support. No. Did I? Any more questions? Uh, I just want to say thank you very much for Thanks. coming up to endowers this thank evening. You. And while I was actually sitting here listening to you, and uh, something really, I, I kept listening for one person, and yes. that person was actually missing in your talk, and that's the African woman. Okay. And Africans are actually the first ones to really pride themselves in saying that behind every successful man, there is always a very strong woman. So I guess my question this evening for you is, where do you see the African woman are really fit into this uh, sort of struggle? Or how has the African woman been there always? Because I mean, you kind of came up with a long list of uh, men who have done things, but I'm sure there were very successful um, and very strong women behind that. So I'm just wondering if this probably I'm just get taking you to a, in a different direction where you're no, 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 not at all. supposed to be going. No. but. Uh, I believe there is a role for the African women, and I just want you to address that a little bit uh, in terms of even the first and the second struggle. And uh, and just, you know, and I'll just some more on where you see uh, the African woman uh, contributing to, to what is going on. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, I'll tell you why the specific women were not mentioned. Um, that's because I am trying here just to retrieve writings okay, uh, that have been done. So I stayed away from, quote unquote, activism, participation in movements, uh, leadership of women's wings, you know, and all those. Uh, in other areas, yes, I do focus on that. And it's not just that women were very important. You know, part of the reason why the second freedom becomes very important for me is in part in my response, you know, to the uh, gentleman who asked the first question. You have women's movements in Africa. You know, you have, you know, uh, various women's leaders. I'm more familiar with West African, you know, uh, women's leaders and so on and so forth. And they have been part of the struggle, and they continue to be. The difference that I'm finding now is that many African feminists want to eat their cake and bake it. There's this so-called commitment to African culture. And I call it so-called because I don't take African culture lightly, but because I believe that no culture is static. And local women have more sense than many of us who are educated, you know, both men and women. So that they keep changing in ways that reflect their daily experience and they actually have all kinds of tools by means of which they affirm their freedom away from some of the patriarchal structures that they have to deal with. That is not often reflected in our writings. And for us to be able to do that, well, I guess those people do, who do empirical work, we have to do more work of representing that. But what I would like to see is for people to take very seriously that when you talk about human rights, a good part of those rights have to do with the fate of women, especially young women. The one that really concerns me is exactly the issue of child marriages <laughs> and the issue of not sending young children to school. And we know, you know, research has confirmed it again and again, but even common sense shows it. I can tell you from my own life and so on and so forth. The more you educate women, <laughs> the more control you have over your population. You don't need drugs. <laughs> okay, so if population is your concern, you educate women. And as you let more women come into 
productive industry away from the much loved informal sector. Okay? The more you expand the economy of the countries concerned. So those will be the kinds of things that I would, you know. I do talk about that in other areas. It's just that for this particular one, uh, and if you do have women's writings that you think would really educate me about this, especially from your neck of the woods, I really would appreciate that. I just don't know them. Uh, the ones I know in West Africa, apart from, you know, uh, activism and, you know, uh, running women's wings of parties and all that, I don't have those from the same generation who wrote regarding all these issues. Did I? In the, in the late 70s or early 80s, there was a book by an author I cannot remember on uh, how the West undeveloped or underdeveloped Africa. Are you familiar with that? And did that affect your, your outlook? Uh, yes, it did. Um, and that's why the title of my book takes off from that. But my book is nowhere near what I wrote is genius. Um, we, I, I read what I wrote as an undergraduate, you know, and that has always uh, been a part of it. And I'm, I've recently gone back to Walter Rodney after teaching a class at my school on aid and Africa. And I'm now developing, arising from Walter Rodney's discussion, a very severe polemic against aid. Thank you. Thank you. Is, may I ask one more? Sure. Please. Um, the, uh, the leaders, many of the leaders in Africa have been elected yeah. and appointed on very very uh, humanistic grounds, yes. democratic grounds, yes. and then they have turned into dictators. What what causes this? Is this from the, from the people up, or is it from their own personality? Uh, in the aftermath of independence, it was the harvest of what was sown under colonialism. Colonialism was not, as I said in my book, a finishing school for democracy and the rule of law. And uh, we are still picking up after them. And that's why, for me, it becomes absolutely crucial to continue to strengthen the capacity of ordinary people to push back when their dignity is being violated. To not accept, you know, uh, because for me as an intellectual, that's my job right now. I don't, I'm not interested in government. I'm interested in strengthening the resolve of ordinary people in the context of civil society to never, and you saw the fruit of that kind of thing in Senegal. The guy read the Constitutional Court, Senegalese people came on the street, they said, no, you are not going to have a third term. And he insisted on the election, they tossed him out. I always trust ordinary people, but we need to strengthen their resolve and educate them. And when we do that, we're going to have a new continent. Last question. Uh, at the outset of your um, the statement, you, I think in Mali, uh, yes. referring to Mali, you said that the uh, uh, in Africa is over. Uh, I hope you're right. I hope so too. <laughs> Remember, I said uh, I'm being optimistic. Majority of uh, in a number of uh, African uh, countries, and uh, my question is actually related to the gentleman's question. Uh, in particular, you mentioned some of the um, uh, leaders, yes, Isaias, yes, Landers, yes, uh, Museveni and yes. others, yes, and their actions uh, or their, the situation right now is really disappointing because they came to revolutionary wars. Yes. And they, uh, their pronouncements were very progressive. But once they came to power, everything they are doing now is to stay in power. Yes. And so where do you see the, um, the, the next step uh, in, the, uh, in the struggle? How do you, 
how do you, in other words, uh, what is the next, what is the next uh, level of the struggle that should be uh, conducted by the African people to, so that we go to the next level? Yes, thank you. You know, the, the basis for my optimism is this. Take countries like Benin, okay? Um, Zambia, uh, Tanzania that never had all these problems, you know, uh, to start with, 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 